Welcome back everyone to another Xamarin Show. I'm your host, James Montemagno, and with me, I'm super excited, digitally, friend of the show, Simon Yeager, he's a uh, technical evangelist, kind of with a specialty, I'm gonna say, I'm just gonna throw it out there, in the Microsoft Graph, and I'm super crazy excited, our first ever digital guest. Um, Simon, how's it going? Good, man, super stoked to be a part of, of something first, like that first <laughs> Skype interview. Super happy to be on, man. Yeah, it's going to be great. I'm not sure where to look. Should I look here? Should I look at this big screen? You can't even see what I'm doing inside the booth. It's kind of cool. But you're literally on 14 <laughs> monitors inside of Channel 9 right now, which is pretty cool. Awesome. I'm going to keep looking nice. like probably behind me as if you're here with me. It's going to be great. Nice, yeah. Um, so sure. You're the uh, voice in my head. <laughs> <laughs> you're looking super fancy. I like it um, for the graph. And the reason I wanted to bring you on is because I saw a tweet from you not too long ago. You were talking about the Microsoft Graph, this awesome app that you had built with Xamarin. Uh, and I, we have talked a lot about, on the Xamarin blog, a lot about Azure AD, a lot about um, getting stuff from your tenants, a lot, a kind of building out some applications. But I'd never seen a full application built out. When I took a look and I downloaded the sample, I saw you playing around with it. I got really excited. I was really into it. So I had to have you on. And it was funny because I think I missed out on you being here in Redmond by like a day. Originally, yeah. yeah, literally, like when I was at the airport, I found your tweet. When I was at the airport back home, I'm like, man, we could have, we could have done this in person. <laughs> but we're making it happen. Um, so first, thanks, thanks for being here. And um, I introduced you a little bit, but maybe tell um, all the listeners a little bit about yourself. Sure. Uh, so my name is Simon Yeager. I'm, as James said, a technical evangelist at Microsoft. I'm within with the uh, evangelism group of Microsoft, and I focus primarily on lots of, of office extensibility, the Microsoft graph, and lately also tons of, of Xamarin. So that's, I guess, is kind of the, what's going to be the topic of today, uh, kind of how I merged the world of, of Microsoft graph and, and Xamarin, essentially. Now, had you, had you been doing any mobile development before Xamarin at all, or did you just kind of jump in? Yeah, for sure. So that's kind of the reason why I... I, I wanted to do that because before doing like office stuff and even before joining Microsoft, like building games and building apps is what I did. Um, so I've done lots of stuff for, for all of the different platforms, everything from, from Android apps to iOS apps to uh, Windows apps with UVP and Windows 8 apps and that kind of stuff. So it was a very natural thing for me to do once I got to focus on the Microsoft Graph. I'm like, of course, I got to make an application with this. <laughs> And then it's like, all right, Xamarin native. Of course, I want to use, uh, you know, reuse my code and write C sharp, which is like the, the the program programming language that I love. So it was a very very natural path for me to to take. Very cool, very cool. Now I had talked previously uh, at at an Ignite, and I've worked with the Office 365 team on integrating some of their SDKs into Xamarin applications. So essentially, how I thought of that use case is like, listen, you're an enterprise and uh, you're using Office 365, you're using Azure AD, and you want to pull in some data, maybe it's documents, maybe it's contact information and build an application. But that was a few years ago. Um, now, the Microsoft Graph, like what is it? Is it a replacement for the Office 365 APIs? Is it a complement? Like what is our graph? Because everyone's talking about graphs, like Facebook has a graph, yeah. like other people have graphs, we have our own graphs. Like what does it even mean? And we don't even just have one graph. Like we had an Azure AD graph, and then we had an Office graph, and now there's a Microsoft graph. Well, I guess to start off, or, or kind of what I try to do is to motivate um, what it is, is to essentially paint what's the problem out there that it's trying to solve. So if you look at all of the, the, the beautiful ecosystem of Microsoft REST APIs, like there's APIs for OneDrive, there's APIs for Outlook, for Azure AD, uh, for OneNote, and, and, and lots of different stuff. And the thing with all of these APIs is that they kind of have their, you know, they have their own, their own personality, their own way of, of, for you to interact with them, their own conventions, their own protocols, and it makes it kind of hard for you as a, as a developer to, to go in and, and engage with one and retake that, uh, whether it's resources or skills or, or application code, and use that on that next API that you want to use with mm -hmm. uh, um, from Microsoft. So what it's trying to solve is is just that problem. The Microsoft Graph is trying to be a proxy 
for you to reach all of those different services, mm. with, with, but with one single endpoint. So it's like one way of doing it with one convention, uh, one way of, of embracing open standards so that I, you can reuse what you know and, and that, pro, uh, that uh, valuable application code that you've, that you've written. So it's kind of like you have your standard REST, like we, we adhering to REST. I'm assuming it's passing back JSON. Yep. Okay. It's all of that stuff. It's JSON, it's yep. REST. You've got okay. OAuth for authentication pro protocols. It's OData for, for, for working with and baking with your data. Mm. Uh, so everything that we kind of love, I guess. It's kind of like when I think of um, the bot framework that we have here at Microsoft, right? There's all these different bot frameworks, just like we have all these different services. Yeah. And they, some of them do very unique things that maybe you really need to integrate with. Like if you're creating an application that only has to do with one drive and that's all you care about, maybe you really want to go deep into there. But almost like an abstraction that can get you down into a common surface area of all these different areas. And Microsoft, just like the bot framework, does that for bots. Um, exactly. So, so the graph framework, is it just RESTful endpoints or is it an SDK or how would um, users even like, how, where would we even find information about it? Like, what were the use cases? Like, you're like, like, before we get to the SDK, like, what are the use cases? You're like, hey, um, I want to build an application. Like, what are good use cases that people would want to use the Microsoft Graph? Yeah. Uh, so, I guess one thing is very natural, like a very natural way of like, hey, I want to get uh, an ability to perhaps store application data in OneDrive mm -hmm. or OneDrive for business with like, you know, one single endpoint. So that's kind of a very straightforward way of, of um, finding a use case. But then there's also more complex scenarios. Uh, for instance, if you wanted to build an application that manages uh, some kind of uh, property, for instance, uh, where you would have uh, files being stored for these properties and you would have conversations going, and then you would have some kind of way of dealing with tasks mm. um, and, and, and storing details and working with, with data in here. So there's many ways of finding very nifty um, uh, use cases for the Microsoft Graph. And what we'll see is, uh, is in the sample is trying to do just that, is kind of using uh, or building like a traditional application and then finding how do we use the Microsoft Graph in here? And it makes perfect sense once you actually look at the different pieces that you have. I mean, all of them have very common, I guess, requirements, such as storing files, such as having uh, interaction between users and collaboration and, and tasks and all that kind of stuff. Awesome. And I mean, if we go ahead and look at, um, if you'll see my screen here, yeah, let me, uh, uh, if you want to cool. find uh, some, uh, some great uh, resources on getting started and, and kind of covering of all of the different things that you can do with a Microsoft Graph, graph.microsoft.io is that perfect place to find all of that information for the Microsoft Graph. And you can also explore like, all right, where are these different um, oh, resources? All the integrations. Yeah. yeah, right? Okay. So you'll find everything that you, will, you'll, you want on this page. Very cool. So, so here we're seeing, now the Microsoft Graph then, and we're seeing here that these are rest points. And uh, if you scroll down just a little bit, I see that we're developing apps. You get this endpoint. And this is what I think is interesting is you have this open ID connection now, does this mean that I can link into my Office 365, I can link into my Azure AD, I can log in with any of those credentials, or maybe I just have a Microsoft account, right? When I go yeah. to visualstudio.com, I log in with my Microsoft account. Um, yeah. I, can, I can do any of those, or what can I do? Yeah, so you're actually, you're actually getting into that, one of those problems that we're trying to solve, mm -hmm. like where every REST API has their own auth mechanism, whether, whether that's uh, MSA, uh, Microsoft accounts, or if you have an Office 365 account, which are different uh, authentication stacks. They're both identity providers, but they're very different. Now, that's exactly what, with the Microsoft Graph, you're able to use both of those. Um, and it's actually done in what's called a, a authentication model version two or so. Okay. That's where you register um, your application now, and it's able to take both MSA, Microsoft accounts, and accounts from Azure Active Directory, which are essentially Office 365 accounts. Okay, cool. So essentially, when we go to this, this here, this graph.microsoft.com, we, we, we'll have this in the show notes, the docs. This is a great page, because if you just scroll down and you're like, hey, listen, I'm do, I want to do anything with that data, right? I want users, yeah. groups, files. Like essentially, 
the Microsoft graph is like perfect for your application. Like I want to do Excel, I want to do people, I want to do notes. And building this yeah. type of application, especially in the enterprise, I can imagine that people already have as Office 365, but they may be using other services here at Microsoft where they want to mix and match. It seems like it's the for perfect, sure. yeah. Yeah. Cool. So, so you started, and the reason, like I said, I wanted to bring you on is because you built this application that you talked about. Um, um, I think it was called like, it has something to do with properties, right? It was like properties yeah. manager or something yeah. like that. And I, I figured I could try to demo it and try to figure it out. But I wanted to have you on to kind of walk through the technology of, of how would you get started with Xamarin? What does the application do? Where are the integrations? And let you talk through it. So if you just want to go to town, I'm just going to sure. poke some, yes. some questions. Go for it. Yes, sir. All right. So um, I guess the best way to describe what we've done here is to uh, showcase what we're talking about, showcase the, the application. Um, so what I'm going to do is to uh, walk you through it uh, fairly quickly, and then we'll dig into the, the, the code and see how things are actually working here. So um, I'm going to start to show you the, the UVP version or the UVP app, and then I'll show you the Android version. Now, I didn't bring my MacBook, so I'm kind of sad that I'm not able to show you the, uh, the <laughs> iOS version, but I got a picture here essentially proving that, if you can trust me, that it is working on an iOS device. And actually, if you go to this page on the Microsoft Graph GitHub repository, you're actually able to download all of the code for the sample and run it on any device that uh, you want to run it on. Very cool, very cool. So um, let's begin here. So what we tried to build here was a, a sample that was, I guess, more than a sample. Um, what you'll find out there is tons of great feature samples that showcase kind of how you make uh, or, or do something. And then there's another sample that shows how do you do something else. What we wanted to try to do here is to make something that ties everything together, ties all these features together and, and, and make something where it, it kind of looks like a real-world application. That's been the intent, intention. So this is essentially an app that some of you might kind of uh, think that, hey, this is something that I could download from the App Store or Google Play or, sure. or Windows Store, and that's kind of been the idea. Yeah, some of so, the kind of the best uh, best samples is like, oh, I would literally actually use this on a day-to-day -day basis or something that I probably yeah. browsed for before. Like those are kind of like, yeah, the, the cool type of examples for yeah, sure. Yeah, for sure. So this one is for if you're managing a uh, if you're managing properties or perhaps if you're a landowner uh, maintaining different properties. This is the application that uh, this is an application that tries to be a tool for you. So um, to showcase that, we we need to log in first and foremost, and I'm going to sign into a, an Office 365 account that I already have. So this is an um, Office 365 account. So we're going to see the on Microsoft.com. Correct. Oh, um, and, and are you using a uh, the Microsoft um, authentication library at this point, or are you using an AD or a different login to do that? So this one is actually using Active Directory authentication okay. library, Adol. Uh, yeah. Mainly, one of the main reasons for it was that Adol is working great with Xamarin. Hmm. Uh, it's got support for all these different platforms, so that was one of the reasons that we wanted to use uh, Adol in this case. Perfect. So once you come into uh, this application, um, first and foremost, this is a UVP uh, version, a UVP version of, uh, of the application. So you'll expect that this is probably going to run on uh, everything from a phone to maybe a HoloLens, but for sure my own uh, Windows 10 uh, desktop PC. So we try to implement some of those uh, responsive uh, features of, of, of it, essentially. But I'm going to kind of, um, uh, I guess, uh, make it look kind of like a phone uh, by keeping this size. So right at the bat, we have the ability to see all of the different properties that I might own or manage. And I can also add new ones. But I'll go into just one um, that's already made here. And what we see right away is tons of details. We have details uh, in terms of a description of the property. We've got details about how many rooms we have, what's the living size, what's the uh, lot size, and what does it cost to operate this property. Mm. And we can go in and we can edit the, these details. Um, and you'll find that things are kind of flowing as you'd expect uh, in a UVP application with animations and that kind of stuff. 
Now, a couple more tabs here is uh, one of them is uh, conversation. So we can keep a discussion going uh, on about this uh, property. For instance, if we are multiple property owners uh, or property managers, uh, we might want to um, have a discussion going about, uh, for instance, um, I was here yesterday and I did something. And we can post that in there. And anyone that signs into this application with uh, from the same tenant, Office 365 tenant, is going to be able to to see this uh, conversation. Oh, cool. So maybe you were, um, maybe you're a landlord, for instance, and you're having a conversation with your tenant, um, and then they have access. Like they, everyone's on your tenant, um, but they only have access to certain properties, and you could control exactly. the flow or something like that. That'd be very cool. Yeah, because you're going to have, you're going to have. I'm thinking as a landlord, right? You're going to have maybe photos of the property, you're gonna have your you know, PDFs of the signed contracts. Right. I shove these you know, documents in some folder randomly and I forget about them and there's yeah. no real, really good, like I have to put it in DocuSign, I have to put stuff over here, right? It's all over the place. Um, yeah. But it seems really cool to have this kind of paper trail, if you will. I think that's what's really important is getting into property management, even just you know, renting, I went through this actually personally recently, is mm -hmm. kind of having that paper trail and it's really important to have, yeah. yeah. For sure. So just as you're saying, you know, you got the abilities uh, to store the files. Uh, just pointing out that, I mean, if you upload here with uh, uh, on the Windows, you'll have the Windows experience. Running this on a phone will get you that phone experience of browsing for files. And then we can go in here and just finally just add a task like, James, do something, please, mm -hmm. and have it in there. Um, and we'll say that, ah, right, he completed it. Or actually, we'll complete it on the Android version. So let's just put it up here on the side of it. And I'll just showcase uh, that it kind of works the same way and do a little bit faster. Um, it's going to sign me right away in because we're using ADL. And what ADL is also doing is just storing those credentials neatly for us so that we don't have to uh, think about that. And what you'll see is like it's the same application, but it, it is more, I guess, it embraces the platform and what makes the platform unique in terms of the UI, which is something that I felt was a, an important part of how do you make something very real and how do you make a real case essentially, a, a real app? Well, UI and UX is a very important piece of that. So that's the reason why uh, in this sample we've spent lots of time making sure that the UI experiences are going to look like they belong on the platform. So as I walk through this one, you'll see that it's got the uh, Google material design icons, uh, but it's the same app, right? You've got the same kind of details. Uh, the conversation is here. Uh, files and we can complete the task like so. So it's the same kind of app, but on uh, I guess uh, uh, in a different flavor depending on which the uh, platform is. Well, that's nice too because you know that's the I mean the, the strong one of the strongest points of Xamarin is that you're building these applications. All of the 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 UI may be separate or maybe the same with Xamarin Forms, but you can tweak it and still make it look extremely nice. So even your icons, right? So your icons are different per platform because it's an Android look and feel or an, a Windows look and feel or an iOS look and feel, um, which is super important. But I'm yeah. imagining here that a bulk of this code isn't the user interface, right? It's a lot of right. forms and a lot of data just to spice it up with a few material designs on Android. But I'm imagining that the bulk of it here is in the the, the shared code. Correct. And, and, and I guess for one that may have, uh, for instance, seen uh, one of the earlier episodes of the Xamarin Show where you covered MVVM, that would be kind of a natural way of, of I guess, abstracting that piece of code into a shared project. Mm -hmm. But when you're looking at this, which is like has these uh, very, very, very native looking UIs, it's kind of like, how do you, how do you do that? How do you make sure that you, ex um, uh, I guess, extract those pieces which are platform specific? Um, and how do you deal with those challenges? Now, that's exactly also what we try to showcase and try to deal with um, in the sample. So if we look at the sample structure, uh, as James was saying, there's a, there's a, there's a shared project, uh, which is that portable project. And then there are these individual platform projects, if you will. If we go ahead and expand this, uh, you'll see that, all right, with the folder structure, it does kind of look like uh, like the MVM pattern here. We have view models that kind of gives it away. But we do have, if we look into each and every single platform project, there's a views folder. And that's the way we achieve the, the uh, kind of uh, extracted views where they make sense to be extracted. 
um, and keep the, the larger code, um, I guess, shared in that portable class um, project. Now, just a quick, uh, a quick pointer, if you want to run this uh, on your own and, and kind of get started, what you'll look for is that constants.cs file. And it's got a bunch of properties um, in here, but there are only three that you'll need to uh, essentially care about, uh, which are the authority, client ID, and redirect URI. So what you'll need to do, and we'll put links to that in the show notes, is to get out to the Azure Active Directory and register your application. And when you've done that, you'll have an authority, a client ID, and a redirect URI that you'll pop in here and you'll be good to go uh, to actually run the sample on your own. Nice. Is there a is there a, is there a sample site set up already, or do you is there a deployment scripts essentially to to kind of get it going? All you need to do is just uh, really to go uh, to any Azure AD um, tenant, and it has a, an application tab um, okay. in order for you to to um, uh, register your application, and you'll just say what's my name, and, and you'll get a client ID, and you'll. Just uh, put in any redirect URI. So I kind of just made up mm, yeah. anything here. And that's where the way Ada works is that it's going to uh, redirect to any pro any redirect URI that you prompt it to. And this is just the way that we figure out that, all right, you're done because it redirected to that URI. Oh, okay, gotcha. Um, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. But you could, I mean, definitely you could go ahead and use that uh, V2 model if you wanted to. Uh, and simply go under the authorization um, menu in uh, the graph.microsoft.com uh, and you will find how you do that. It's super, oh, okay. super simple. Gotcha. And you have Azure AD and then there's the V2 endpoint. Very cool. So like um, if we drill uh, a little bit into uh, the code uh, again, and we can ask ourselves, all right, how do we achieve this MVVM pattern? Uh, the MVVM pattern is very, very, I guess, uh, natural if we look at the UVP um, project. In here, we've actually worked with, with uh, MVVM for a while. There's lots of uh, support that comes in very naturally when you're typing the XAML. But for the other platform, it's platforms, it may not be super straightforward. So the way that we do that is essentially by bringing in a uh, library, which is called MVVM Cross. Mm, cool. It's uh, one of those very uh, popular MVVM Cross or MVVM <laughs> libraries for Xamarin, works great, super simple to get started with. All you do is to just bring up uh, the NuGet package manager in every project and pull it into your project and you're essentially, you're good to go at, the, good to go at this point. Yeah, so you, we, haven't, we haven't talked about too much of the MVVM frameworks yet besides what's built into Xamarin Forms. So this application was not built with Xamarin Forms. You went the traditional route, you built out of this shared code here, we're seeing extensions, models, view models, and then you've abstracted views in each platform. And, um, I always get a lot of questions like, hey, you know, I want to have MVVM in place, or I've already done it in Windows application. How do I do data binary? Because iOS and Android, they don't have it built in, and, and you got to get there somehow. Um, it's yeah. easy to kind of rig up your own, just like kind of subscribe to property change notifications. But MVVM Lite and MVVM Cross are very two popular frameworks, and uh, I've worked with both. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, MVVM Cross is really cool because on Android, it'll actually tie into some of the, the views, which is cool. But essentially, yeah. think of MVVM as the is or MVVM cross, I guess, as as the glue. I think uh, they would put it as the glue between your shared code and your and your UIs. So you're still building native UIs on each platform, but you're able to share maybe a little bit more by by not having to write those bindings manual, manually. Yeah, I guess yeah. right. Very That's cool. a beautiful thing about like Xamarin Native is that you could use your skills and and maybe you know. Maybe you're exceptionally good at building uh, iOS uh, views with the iOS designer. You could go into that designer and build those views. Uh, and that's the just awesome thing about it, which is exactly what um, is actually contained with this sample. So in this sample, you'll see how do you build like a native UI, and also how do you bind that to that um, core project. Very cool. Now, now, for like the login view, for instance, you just brought in, I assume, the, the ADAL, the library, right, to do that? Actually, uh, it's a little bit more abstracted. Uh, mm. The login view actually brings in the graph service, okay. uh, which we'll look at, which is just um, your way of calling uh, the graph service. And the graph service itself is the one that pulls in the ADL. And, okay. and that essentially is, is taken care of by MVVM cross. It, it allows you to just 
uh, type essentially what you want, and it's going to get you what you want. Okay. And the way it's done is essentially by, mm -hmm. uh, if you look at app.ts, uh, anything that starts with MVX, by the way, is something that's related to MVVM cross. And here we define an app and we just say, all right, um, here's a, a couple of services that we have uh, which are implemented in the core project. Now, there's more services that we have, but they're implemented in the platform projects. And I'll show you why we do that. Uh, but finally, we'll also say what's the starting point for this application, which in our case is naturally going to be, well, the login view because we have to log in uh, first and foremost. If we look at the login view, um, I want to show you bindings here. Mm -hmm. um, in the login view, we have the logging command, uh, which essentially is, is the logic for what's going to happen when someone pushes a login button. And in the base, there is a, an is loading property as well. So there are essentially two properties or two um, entities that you can bind towards in the login view model. And if you look at, um, we can begin at the UVP platform uh, project, actually, because this is a very natural place for uh, bindings to take place in the XAML. And scrolling down, there is a button, which is that button that I clicked to sign in. Yep. And what it does is that it's got that command, and it's binding to that login command. And then there's a visibility, which is binding to that is loading property, and it's also got a converter. Converter is kind of like um, a way of transforming a value into uh, something else so that it fits uh, the property that we're binding to uh, on the, I guess, the UI component. So in this case, is loading is, is a Boolean, but this one needs an enumerator that is simply says visible or, or collapsed. So we need to uh, write a converter that just uh, transforms that value into uh, an appropriate value here. Sure. So if uh... So if anyone's been doing WPF, UWP, or Xamarin Forms work, this is going to look very familiar because this is just the UWP yes. project. And then on the Android side of things, it's probably going to look a little bit different because you're still in the Android XML, I assume, right? Exactly. So the Android uh, project, which is kind of like iOS project in the sense that it has, it does have like a backing C sharp file, but it doesn't have anything in here. Oh, okay, That's yeah. because we build, you know, we build those, um, we do build those views. Uh, for Android, we build those uh, in kind of like uh, layout files, which are those XML ones that you talked about. We can open the login activity, and instead of looking into the designer, we can look into the source, and we'll find the button. Yep. And it's got one of those MVX uh, terms in there as well. We can kind of figure out, all right, that's probably MVVM across here. But it's fairly, I think it makes sense what it, what's doing here. Like it's binding that, again, logging command to the click property. And it's binding the is loading property on the view model to the visibility property on the button. And using a converter again uh, to convert that value into the appropriate format. Uh, so again, it's, it's, a, it's kind of the same thing that we're achieving, but more in the flavor of how would you build a UI on an Android uh, platform. Sure, that makes sense. And essentially with MVVM Cross, you're doing um, less code in the code behind of that actual view and a little bit just putting those bindings into the actual Android XML or into the iOS view specifically um, yeah. for each of them, which kind of makes a lot of sense in, uh, of how you'd want to abstract that away. And, and even when I do it without a framework like MVVM Cross or MVVM Lite, I kind of do that little thing where I'm just like, I really want to modify just the smallest bit of code possible that's in yeah. the view or not in the view to do that. That's kind of, it's a very nice approach, yeah. Yeah, that's a beautiful thing about this, that once you've done this, we can make any changes to, for instance, how logging occurs um, on all of the platforms by simply editing the view model. Yeah. We don't have to make that change in every single platform project. We can do it in one place eliminate bugs, make feature updates or anything, and it's going to get applied to all of those other places. Just beautiful. Yeah, so if you want to then maybe change it from using ADAL to something else, then you change it just in the shared code, you're good to go. And you can see here, this is the iOS one, right? And you're yep. doing as in the code behind binding. That's it. That's all the code. That's pretty cool. That's yeah. all. And yeah. it's more more of a way to how do you would do it on, how would a UI, uh, iOS developer um, be familiar to developing um, code essentially. So you would put it in the view did load and 
creating what's called a binding set, which is sort of the context between the log and view, or the glue, if you will, between uh, log and view and the log and view model. And then it's the same sort of approach. You're binding the to the logging command. You have the visibility property of the sign-in button, binding it to the is loading, and using a converter again uh, for to transform that value. So same idea, but in a different way, uh, depending on on the platform that we're in. Cool. So let's say that they've already logged in. Now we get to the the meat of the application, right? So. So how do we start accessing the graph? We've already gotten our token. Let's just assume that ADAL does its thing. It's great. How do we actually get access to the SDK? Is there, is there a NuGet that I bring in, or is it endpoints, or how is this thing handled? So there's, uh, you actually have a couple different uh, ways to do this. Um, and it depends on really what you want to do. Okay. Uh, so the first thing that to kind of know about the Microsoft Graph is that it's sort of uh, split or, I guess, developed in branches. So there's a version 1.0, and then there's a beta branch. Okay. And there's SDKs for, um, for version 1.0. Uh, for, uh, let's see, it's, uh, there's for Java, there's for Objective-C, uh, which you actually can bring into Swift with uh, bridging headers, um, and then there's for Xamarin. So you could, uh, if you're happy with everything that's within version 1, you can bring in uh, an SDK which has all the models and everything set up for you Mm -hmm. And it's super simple to get started. Now, the, the sample, it's actually uh, targeting the beta branch, which meant that, all right, we had to implement uh, those REST calls on our own because there, weren't any, there aren't any SDKs available for the beta branch. Um, however, those resources that we were consuming in the Microsoft Graph uh, when I built the sample, uh, they are actually now within <laughs> version 1. So I'm actually thinking about uh, switching to... Uh, the SDKs just because they're really beautiful to use and easy to, uh, it's just, you know, you don't have to maintain this. Yeah, so essentially if the model changes or something else, so if you want to be, if you want to be cutting edge, you would go down this approach that you're showing here, like, oh, there's some brand new API that hasn't made it into the SDK just yet. I'm really, I'm living on the edge, right? Yeah. Um, someone tweeted at me, I was tweeting, um, that I installed Android 7.1, the beta, the beta betas, um, and they're like, it's not on your, <laughs> they're like, it's not on your daily phone. I'm like, I live on the edge. I want everything. <laughs> I get it. So if you're living on the edge and you want to access the beta, because we're always, I'm assuming the graph is always revving new APIs coming up um, yeah. as, as services release. So you, you may want to go down this route. At least know how to do it. I think that's what's probably important is how do I do it if I need to go yeah. down that approach? Else you would just consume an SDK, I assume, as a NuGet package and go to town. Yeah. And it's cool. nothing wrong if you want to combine them as well. I mean, you could mm -hmm. use the SDK and then just use the REST calls for those pieces that aren't implemented. Okay. But yeah. as you're saying, like if you know how to do it, um, it that, that's going to make it so much easier to not just uh, uh, pulling in a part from the beta branch, but also if things happen to go wrong, you'll be much more um, having a better chance of understanding what's actually going wrong here. Gotcha. Okay. But actually to show you why it's kind of simple to uh, combine um, both the SDK and um, SDK and the um, uh, and just making bare bone rest uh, SDK uh, bare bone rest calls essentially, which is that um, in the uh, SDK essentially the only thing that you do when you instantiate a client in the Microsoft Graph SDK is that you give it an access token. Sure. And if sure. you're already combining that, you already have a way of getting it. You can just Put that access token on a bare bone REST call, or you could give it to the graph client, and you're ultimately good to go. Okay, yeah, and that's the most important part is that is that I've logged in somehow. I have this token, and that token is going to be sent to, to authenticate every single time when I make any REST call with the SDK or with this HTTP call. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. And if you want to get a if you want to get a good overview of what the uh, what we're what kind of graph calls this sample actually is doing. Um, the way that the sample is built is that uh, what we actually saw in the beginning that if I go into the constructor, you'll see that their mm -hmm. interfaces only um, are only um, provided in the constructors. Okay. And those interfaces are here, and you can find if you go into them uh, what are the methods on this interface, which is ultimately, ultimately what is actually going to be implemented. The reason why it's interfaces is that that's kind of the way we uh, inject the services with MVVM cross. So we define what's this going to be like, what were we expecting the service to uh, provide us with, and then it doesn't matter if this is implemented like the graph service, which is implemented in the core project, 
But then there's other services like the authentication service, which is ADL. There's an implementation for every uh, every oops, platform project of that service because it's uh, it's more platform dependent than the graph services. The graph service can be it's going to be similar everywhere, whereas authentication on every platform is a little bit different. We just want to make sure to store places, I guess, in, in, in different places. Sure. Uh, yeah. so that's the way it's, it's kind of done. Cool. So it seems like you're able to get users, you're able to authenticate, you're able to get the files. So anything that you were kind of showing in the application, it it's there for you yeah, to use. For sure. Yes. And it, it makes it kind of easy also for you to, if you want to just take out a part, take a piece out of this sample, and just plug this service into your own. You can do that, it's super simple. Grab the interface, uh, grab MVVM cross into your project, and then you'll be ready essentially to go and, and consume that. Okay. Now, if you wanna, uh, if you look at the graph service, you'll see how essentially all the calls are being made. So there are a couple of helper, helper methods that uh, transform the JSON into C sharp objects, uh, which is done with uh, the Newtonsoft uh, JSON library. And what we're doing with the helper methods is just to say essentially, uh, all right, I'm expecting one object, or I'm expecting many objects. Mm, okay. So it's just if you're in, if it's an array or if it's not an array. Um, and then we're providing uh, what's the URL to this. And if you wanted to make this call uh, on your own. You could essentially just use the, the um, uh, endpoint for the, the Microsoft Graph, graph.microsoft.com, and then you would specify what's the branch, and if that would be beta, that would be beta, or if it's version 1.0, you would put that in. Oh, let's go with beta. Let's live on the okay. edge. Yeah. <laughs> and then you would just put that piece in there. So oh, okay, gotcha. super, super straightforward to do that. Uh, remove this. So then you have get one async, get many. So essentially, you've abstracted it away, even your HTTP calls, because normally you're like, I need to go get this, I need to go get this, I need to go get this, and then yeah. that will go out, handle it for you. Can we take a look at one of those, like the get many, for instance? Absolutely. I can actually follow along. So yeah. uh, if we start from from, the, from this place, okay. where we have, um, all right, we want to get uh, we're going to get ourselves um, here. And if we F12 into that, and we'll be taken into um, another helper method that simply just says uh, it keeps the same URL, but it just attaches the fact that, all right, this is going to be an, a get method. Yep. And then it's just going to put that over into a send a sync method that uh, does the, um, um, that, that makes sure essentially that there's a token uh, present in your request. Okay, gotcha. So what it's yeah. doing is just putting it on the request, and if it's not there, it's going to pop open Adel and ask you to sign in and just attach the token to your request. Yeah, or for instance, maybe your Adel token has expired, and you, you it needs to go get a brand new one, and it'll revalidate a new token. Correct. Yeah, cool. And I noticed that if we F12 in interfaces, we don't get a lot. <laughs> Yeah. Instead, you could uh, pop open into because at this point we're using the HTTP service, um, and if you wanted to look into how that one is built, which is also super straightforward uh, with the the oh, cool. HTTP methods uh, doing different things depending on what it is, um, and just throwing it over to the the built-in HTTP client. So it's very uh, simple and it's kind of just abstracting away. Um, those different uh, calls. Yeah, so they're ba it's essentially super drop dead simple HTTP calls that anyone's probably done. I mean, you probably, if anyone's seen me do any demos on the Xamarin show, I'm always going off, yeah. doing some gets, getting some data. Maybe it's weather, maybe it's stock information, uh, maybe it's something from yeah. Azure, right? Even Azure exposed a REST API. You're getting them, you're using standard HTTP calls, um, and then it gets stuff back. And then, oh, it's this puppy. What you got going on here? Perfect. Well, if you want to just uh, if you want to do this without code and kind of explore uh, how what, what's the responses that Microsoft Graph is going to deliver to you, um, you can do that uh, call using uh, what's called the Graph Explorer, which is on that graph.microsoft.com page. Super cool tool where you can essentially just type in those requests, uh, specify the branch, uh, the HTTP methods, hit submit, 
And what it's going to do is to uh, make that call for you, attach the tokens and all that stuff. And you're able to see what are you actually going to get from that uh, from that request. Oh, cool. And that way you can kind of explore the graph without building an app or anything. And it's a good starting point if you uh, just want to see what's it all about and what you can do and what you can expect. Yeah. And then what you do is you copy that, right? You copy right. that and then you take it to json to csharp.com. <laughs> Actually, have you seen this? Oh, I think I know what you're about there to do. It it's pretty great. Which one is it? Uh, I'm going to search. This thing is awesome. Paste as JSON as classes. Boom. So right if you got it on Studio. the clipboard, yeah, this is awesome. So, uh, but I've, I've been using that page a lot, I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah, so that's what, that's what I like to do. I either like to paste it or I like to put in JSON as csharp.com, get my C sharp models. And, and that's the instance where, listen, like you don't have an SDK. The SDK will set up the models for you. Yeah. But in this instance, we're not going to do it. Now, the question is, so let's say you're, um, you're using some stuff on the beta. Does it get merged into 1.0 or does it get merged into 1.1? 1 .1? Or like, how does, how does that happen? Like, as a developer, that concerns me is, is like, okay, well, maybe they come out with a, a 1.5. And mm -hmm. is it breaking changes? Or if it gets put into 1.0, does that mean no breaking changes? Like, what, what's the protocol here? So as long as you're just to, I guess, a kind of pointer, if you're on the beta bench, you're consuming uh, or making calls here, uh, those you, you, I guess, kind of should expect to be changed. Uh, or if you're relying on them, it might break you. Uh, okay. One of those things is, is just great because uh, what they're doing is, uh, is actually to gather lots of feedback. That's the reason why they're kind of in the beta branch. Uh, so they're getting feedback from the community saying, what do you like about this call? What do you want us to change? And they're actually doing that. So when they're changing something is usually because the community has said that they wanted it changed. Now, if that happens, um, um, it, you know, you'll kind of know that, or you know, you'll kind of feel like, yay, this is not the way I work with webhooks usually. This would probably be changed and then usually gets changed. Uh, if it kind of works, uh, I've, I've noted that I built lots of apps on the beta branch and it just works flawlessly. <laughs> uh, so, so I'm, I'm, I guess I'm also a little bit of uh, a guy living on the edge. But uh, as I've seen, they they are working, they're working um, or being stable for a while. They get put into uh, the version 1.0 uh, currently. That's what uh, at least what everything has been uh, up until now. So everything that's been into the beta branch, been there for a while, been stable, that's been eventually put into the version 1.0 branch. But it's still in the beta branch, oh, so okay. you'll still have yeah. the, the same API, if you will, and then you can just swap over to uh, the version 1.0 uh, if you wanted to, and you know, kind of feel a bit more safe. That makes sense. That makes sense. So even if you're experimenting with a beta for a while, for a while, and then it gets put into 1.0, you just toggle it over essentially, and you're, you're yeah. good to go. Cool. Correct. Awesome. So it seems yeah, it seems pretty pretty straightforward. Then you're going off making these calls, bringing it back. And it seems like you could put, you could post, you can patch, you, you do your standard REST call. It's just a REST API. I mean, that's a, that's a beautiful thing is when I think about it is that it's just a standard API. So if, you, if you've done any REST calls before or done anything in ASP.NET, you kind of understand what's going on. Yeah. And it's really nice that it's JSON. I was messing around with the Office 365 API for a while, and it was like some of it was like old data feeds, and it was like this, and you're like, oh, there's like so yeah. much going on. It felt very, um, it didn't feel as modern as I wanted it to do. And this seems super modern. Um, especially using yeah. things like ADAL to do that. And I really like this architecture. This is really cool reference architecture. To, I might steal some code from this. <laughs> yeah, please, please yeah. do. There's a couple of things that uh, one might uh, need to be aware of. And uh, I try to, we also try to point those out in the code. And here's one of them, um, which is, uh, I believe, not true anymore because that's been changed. Um, but it's done with a, a, a different kind of set of uh, uh, APIs that you'll do this through. But if you wanted to upload a file which is larger than four megabytes, uh, we can't do that using the Microsoft Graph. That would be something you'd need to do with a one uh, with a bare bone or OneDrive API. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, but that's been implemented. But it's just in a, a different way now, where you create a session instead of what's called an upload session, and you upload the the fragments instead. Uh, so we try to keep pointers to those things in the code. 
uh, so that you can be aware of, of uh, when things like that uh, should be uh, taken into account. Yeah, also if you're uploading a 100 meg file, you might want to put that in a background service, and you may want to adhere to each platform's way of uploading really big files. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, probably and a limitation like this is probably a hint that maybe you should do it in a different way. Exactly. Cool. <laughs> oh, cool. Uh, Simon, is there anything else you want to show off at all, or any last pointers, tips, and tricks? I, I guess just this is the um, uh, repository. Uh, for for the sample, uh, it's on the Microsoft Graph GitHub repository. Uh, you'll find the details uh, about uh, how to get started on this thing and how to build it uh, in the uh, readme readme.md file. Uh, so definitely a, a good place to get started if you want to run the sample. And also, if you want to learn more about it and kind of dig more into uh, more of the design part, how the the UIs were built natively. Uh, or perhaps the Xamarin part of how it kind of works with the services and dependency injection. Uh, I do have blog posts covering those topics on my blog at simonjaeger.com. And if there's any changes that you would like to see uh, on the uh, on the sample, I mean, please go ahead and 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 reach out. Uh, use the issues in the repository, or do contribute to uh, to the sample yourself. I would be very happy to see that happen. Very cool. Well, awesome. This has been awesome. I really like to see it live, sell the code, love the architecture. Um, yeah, Simon, thank you so much for being our first digital guest and, uh, and coming all the way live from Sweden, right? That's where you're at right thanks now? For, yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, awesome. Well, this has been The Xamarin Show. Until next time.